This week we move into week five on our series, What on Earth Am I Here For? In your bulletin you'll see a blue insert that has some sermon notes that you can use to follow along. I encourage you to take it out, and there should be pens in the pews in front of you. If you need one or would like one, stick up your hands, and one of our amazing ushers will come and bring you one. Um, As we pull those out, I do want to mention I, I said to thank Dale and Dan. There are many other people who have helped downstairs, too. They came to mind because they're the ones who broke the big concrete out of the middle and left the rubble down there. Um, But there are many others who have scraped floors, who have um, done painting, who have done all kinds of stuff. So we're grateful for all of that. And if any of you are feeling like um, Emen or Hulk following service, there's four, you know, 200-pound pieces of concrete you could haul out of the basement for them. Um, If not, they're going to get a dolly. So, But if any of you are up to the challenge, head down there after pull them out. We'll even provide the straps. The series that we're working through right now is a series that's based on a book that many of you will have read probably about a decade ago. It's based on The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren out of Saddleback Church in California. He re-released the book with a few edits under the title, What on Earth Am I Here For? As I've mentioned throughout the series, uh, I've reread the book, the new version, and it's impacted me again in ways that I didn't expect. Sometimes when you reread something, you, you notice things that are different, uh, but at the same time, it's something that has really impacted me, I think because there have been so many life situations and opportunities that I've had with people throughout the past four or five weeks to really use and talk about many of the same themes that we've been talking about. We've been talking about the first week how we matter to God, that God created us for a reason, for a purpose, and that he truly does love us. I've used the phrase each week that says that we were created for a specific purpose, that God looked at the world and he said, we needed one of you in the world, that he wanted you here for a reason and for a purpose. So when you look around beside you, when you look into your own heart, you can think, It doesn't matter what anybody else says, but God truly made me to be me and chose for me to be in the world and to be in this city, in this job, in this church, and in your family for a specific reason and a specific purpose. You truly do matter to God exactly the way you are. We talked about how we were planned for God's pleasure, that God made us that we matter to him, and that he truly does love us. He finds delight in us. We look through a number of different scriptures that describe that, that talk about how God smiles upon us, how he finds delight in the things that we do and in his creation. As we stumble, as we work towards him, as we fall back, as we move ahead, God loves us, cares for us, and finds great delight in us. And for me, this was foundational. To truly understand that God loves me, that he finds delight in me, not because of anything I've done, but because he made me and he created me. Everything that we see within the Bible, all of the instructions and guidance come from a God who truly does love me and wants to be with me. Not someone who is sitting up on a throne ready to judge, but someone who finds delight and care and pleasure in his creation, in you and I. Then we talked about how we were formed for God's family, the body of Christ. And each of us has gifts for different reasons and different places. We're going to explore that a little bit more today. But we were made to do life together as a family, as a body in Christ. And then last week we talked about how we were created to become like Christ, that we are to grow in our Christ-likeness. We can call it discipleship as we get to know him better. There's a theological word I didn't use last time, but it's called sanctification. That's growing in holiness, growing to be more like Jesus, more like who God created us originally to be before sin entered the world. And today there is a fourth purpose. The fourth purpose is that you were shaped to serve God. The first fill in the blank, if you're writing them down, you were shaped to serve God. At 
at the back, excuse my throat, <clears throat> at the back there are a little devotional booklets as well as bookmarks. And on the bookmarks there are different memory verses for each week of the series. And this is the memory verse for week five. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. For we are God's handiwork. We were created by him. Other versions call us his masterpiece. A masterpiece is a good word. Handiwork is, brings another nuance to it, and other translations go different. But when you look at what is trying to be expressed here, it's that God made us, molded us, shaped us, finds great delight in us, so much so that he loves us and cares for us and sent his son Jesus to die for us. Each and every one of us was created by the hand of God, and each and every one of us he considers a masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. There is no one else like you, no one else like me. We are each individuals and we are all created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Other versions talk about ministry or talk about service. But we were created by a God who wanted us and loves us. And because of what he has done for us through Christ Jesus, we also grow to be like him. And to be like him, we take on some of his characteristics. Characteristics of love and grace and forgiveness and service and ministry. Loving those around us so much that we change how we act and what we do to help others, to love others, to serve others in <clears throat> new ways because of who God is. We were not made to just take up space to breathe or to live a self-centered life and then one day die. God put us here because he wanted us and for a reason and purpose. Remember, God wanted you here. He created each one of you. And I could look through the room and start naming people and say, you know, God made you. God made each of you. And he made you because he wanted you here for a specific reason and purpose. And part of that, as we're discovering, this is the fourth one, is that we were shaped to serve. That there's part of the reason that God put us here is to serve, to minister, to be a blessing to others. The word servant and the word minister um, can come from the same Greek word, and sometimes in the Old and New Testament they're used interchangeably. But the idea is the same, that we are all servants and we are all ministers. So in essence, scripturally, we need to believe that our life, that my life calling is to be, is to be a bivocational minister of Jesus. Each of us have our own jobs, things that we do. Some of you may be retired, some of you may be students, but each of us is called to serve, to minister for Jesus in addition to the other things that we do and will add because of what God has done for us, we do the other things, the work, the family life, the service that we give to our community and to our church. In one way, um, bivocational, I think most of us understand what it is, but you can make all kinds of different analogies. So it's like bifocals and glasses. They help you see both far away and up close without having to change glasses um, if they work right and once you get used to them. But they help you to see two things at the same time that you're having trouble with. Bivocational ministers, we live this life for two purposes, ultimately for God, and because of that, we serve him in ways at the same time. Two different things are happening at the same time. We're bivocational ministers of Jesus. No matter what job we have, whether it's nurse or teacher, parent, retired, whether we flip burgers, paint walls, or are a student, if you're a Christian, biblically, we are all to be bivocational. We are to live a life that follows the things that God has told us at the same time as doing the other things that may seem mundane, but God has brought to us for a specific reason. 
I think there are a couple of reasons that we do this. It's to help others and to honor God. Everything we do in life, we do for these reasons, to help others and to honor God. I may have a job, but within that job I do it to help others and to honor God. A scripture that pr- provides some light into this passage is Colossians 3.17. I'll find it on the screen this morning. Uh, you can read with me. It says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, <clears throat> whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Everything that we do can be done and should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. I can do all kinds of things and bring glory and honor to him. I can take out the garbage every two weeks. That sounds really strange, but this week I got to go and take out the garbage for my neighbor whose son has cancer and take that out. Minor thing, I don't think they even know who did it, and that's fine. I'm not telling you to... But you know what I mean. Simple, simple things. I had a youth pastor that I worked with once while I was in school that I volunteered with, and he said, I can tell who truly gets it when they're walking through the church and they see something on the carpet and they bend over and pick it up, even though it's not their job. They understand that it's more than just me, that there's more to this world, to this life, to the things that I should do. We can do all kinds of things and consider the ministry from changing a dirty diaper to cleaning the living room to making a business deal to helping someone cross the street to all of the things that we do in this world. All of our various jobs and all of our various family commitments can be done in a way that both brings honor to God and serves or ministers to someone else. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord giving thanks to God the Father through him. It becomes part of our ministry, everything we do, if we do it with the right motivation. This makes menial tasks become meaningful when I do it out of my love for Jesus. It makes menial tasks become meaningful when I do it out of my love for Jesus. I've heard people talk and say some of the same things. And even when I first read them within the Purpose Driven Life, I thought, well, there's some stuff that just really doesn't matter. But it really does if we give our lives over to God and give him every aspect and control of everything that we do. Because we can sit and we, or we can walk and we can grumble and complain about the menial things that we do, or we can look at it as something that God has brought us here for And that no one may ever notice on this earth, but he notices when we stop and pick that garbage up, when we um, pass on the closest parking spot because there's someone right behind us and we move a little further out, when we take time and be patient with someone. There are so many occasions in my life and stories I could tell you where people have come and said, they've noticed something about me, and when I asked them what it was, it was the smallest little thing and it stuck out in their mind. Even the meaningless tasks can become meaningful if they're done with the right motivation and for the right reason. They become significant. All of the things that we do, from the small to the large, can become and should be considered part of our ministry, of our service, of the ways that we serve. And people may not know this, but God will. Remember back to the verse that is the the key verse for this week, Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We were created. We were God's handiwork in Christ Jesus to do good works. Salvation and service at the same time in Christ Jesus, to do good works. When we become a believer, when we we begin to follow Jesus, we step across the line, and we not only accept his salvation, but we look up and say, what's next, God? We recognize his love for us, 
We recognize that we need to be part of a family of believers so that we can grow and learn. We recognize that we have gifts that have been given to us and that there are ways that God calls us to step even a step further in our service of him and for him and for others. Every one of us has a ministry. Not all of us who are called will differentiate. Not all of us are called to be pastor. But all of us, including myself, are called to be ministers. Remember, minister and servant can be the same Greek word. We are all called to minister to, to serve, really to provide a blessing to someone else. Whether they know it or not, God does. I did some looking when we talk about serving, about being minister, ministers to others. Um, it's kind of talking about being the hands and feet of Jesus and serving him. So I went through our list of people in the church, a couple of different lists, and I put some numbers together that I want to share with you that I find quite interesting and really, really encouraging. Here at Massey Place Community Church right now, in the morning service only, we have um, 96 people who would call this church their home this fall. 96 people who would consider who we have on our, our roles that attend regularly. Just talking about this fall. I just looked at September and October. There is an average morning attendance year long from January till now, to the end of September, I should say. Um, morning attendance of 58. So of the 96 people who call this their church home, the average attendance is 58. Which I think is pretty good. I think we can do a little bit better. Um, but it's compared to other churches, I know it's not bad to have that number regular as an average attendance. And remember that July and August are pretty low, and they're mixed in that number too. So last Sunday was 68. We're here last Sunday for the church service, the total attendance. So those numbers do climb as the fall goes on. But 58, I think, is not bad, especially when I look at what other churches have as their ratio as well. And of those people, we have 47 who serve in some capacity. So the 58 average attendance, there are 47 who serve and have served in some capacity just this fall. Those fall with an average attendance of 58, and with 47 who have served, I think that's a really good number and encouraging to see so many different people who have made that step of commitment and serving the church in their various ways. So I went through the list, and it's everything from lawn care to working with their children to working on the building to leading a small group for Bible study, everything that people are involved in in one way or another, the kitchen as well. And I do want to make mention that there are 40 people from children to adults who are engaged outside of the Sunday service in a small group growth or discipleship or Bible study. So we have 40 people this fall who are growing. That includes our children and everyone else making a commitment to grow outside of the Sunday morning service, which I think is a really good number as well. If you're curious, the average attendance overall is 102 when we add in our Spanish service for January to September. 47 different people are engaged just within this church in bivocational ministry. It's not just what we do for the church that would be considered ministry, but it gives a good sense of how people are engaging and what they are engaging in and the commitments that they have made. And I think it's quite amazing. I know that there are many of you who give many, many hours weekly to the life of the church. There are many on the leadership team and the trustees who have been here for hours doing various things from being diligent with the giving and the record keeping to the projects that are taking place to the Sunday school teachers that uh, work downstairs in Kids Church. There are so many ways that people give and give a lot. And then there are others who give as time enables them to the ministry of the church in the kitchen and at the door and as ushers and greeters. And each and every one of us is God's handiwork. He created us and brought us here for a reason and a purpose. 
and many of us have begun to figure out what that is. Many of us are working well within it. Many of us are slowing down a little, which happens as we age. But it's amazing how God still engages and uses us through every stage of life. So what happens if I begin to use my life to give it over even more to this fourth purpose, this calling to serve, to minister, to be a bivocational minister of Christ. I think we need to stop thinking so much about ourselves all of the time and start thinking about other people in our life. It's the key to service and to biblical service to doing it in God's name. Not thinking about how I can be served, but instead thinking about how I can can serve others. There are amazing benefits to us as we begin to serve as well. And I want to talk about four of them this morning as we move through what service looks like and the benefits that we receive as we begin to serve. And each of these are biblical. The first one is that serving others unselfishly will create joy in our lives. Serving others truly can and truly does create joy. The look on people's face as you open up the door for them, as you greet them there, as you hand them a bulletin, or when you give them a tour of the basement and they're shocked at how thick the wall was of concrete that you cut through. Little things in serving others can bring great joy to our life. Most people look for happiness in all of the wrong places, and we know this to be true. You don't find happiness in money or pleasure or power or possessions or prestige. Some of these things may bring popularity, but popularity and happiness are definitely different things. All of those things are temporary. But long-lasting, permanent joy comes through service by giving our lives away to others in God's name and in God's way. See, God wired us when he created us and when he designed us to be givers, to serve, to minister to others. And when we minister to others, the joy that flows through us is something that God designed us to live with and to live for. I think he did this because he too was a giver. And if you look back into the Old Testament, it talks about how we were created in his image. And there are bits of him in us. So we too have the capacity to love and to forgive and to serve and to minister to others. Just as he loves and he serves and he gives unselfishly to us. Serving others unselfishly will create joy in our lives. And there are a couple of secrets to joy that I want to tell you about. These are secrets that I'll tell you about as long as you spread the word. They're not to be kept quiet. One of those secrets to joy is that we need to get the focus off me. That it's not about me. Get the focus off of us and put it towards others. If we shift from an inward focus to an outward focus, it's all about God and it's all about serving others, not what I get from any particular situation. The act of service has to be directed outwards. And this is counter-cultural, I think, to every ad and TV show and self-help book that says that it's all about us. That we all do it, we can have it our way, that we can go ahead if it feels good. The act of biblical service is counter-cultural to all of the things that are coming towards us because the focus is outward and not inward. But in our outward focus, it changes us inward as well. Paul talks about this in this verse in Philippians chapter 2. He says, But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. 
even if I am being poured out. He's giving himself so much. He's talking about how his life is being poured out for them. The drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith. I am glad and rejoice with all of you. Glad is happy. Rejoice is just uh, the verb kind of form of joy, right? When we are joyful with others, we rejoice with them. It's a fact of life that most people, that the, that the most helpful people in the world are that also the happiest people that we will find. If you want to be happy, you have to be helpful because that's the way God made us. He designed us that way. The more self-centered we become, the more unhappy we're going to be with life. It's just kind of the way it works. Joy floods into the soul when we begin to give ourselves away and serve others. Because that's the way God wired the universe and he wired us to be. The second secret. We need to get the focus off me. Oh, that's the same one. The second secret is, um, oh, there's another verse here. Sorry, my pages are mixed up. Let's go to the next one, Danny. The second secret is that I want to use my gifts, use my gifts to help others. Joy comes from getting the focus off myself and then using my gifts and talents to help others. When we use the gifts that God gave us to help other people, it feels good, doesn't it? It really, really does. From what we may see as little to what may be seen as big, when we step forward and offer what we have in the service of God and to help others, it really, really does feel different. We begin doing the things that we were created to do, that God wired us to do. It changes who we are. First Peter 4.10, it says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Each of us should use whatever gifts God has given us to serve others. We all have special abilities, and we all have special callings. And it's not just to make lots of money. God has given us these gifts and talents to serve others. We're blessed in order to be a blessing. We've been through some of the things we have in life, I think, in order to help others who will go through the same thing. Because life just seems to keep coming around, doesn't it? We have been given great gifts, but we also have been given some responsibility to use those to help serve others. With our skills, our time, our talents, whatever we've got, we need to use it to help other people in ministering to them and blessing them because of what God has done for us. Not so that we get something out of it, even though it does change us, because God wired us that way, but because it gives something to them as well. Serving others unselfishly will not only create joy in my life, serving others will help improve my relationships. And I think it's missing a why, so you can add that. Oh, someone did already. Serving others will improve my relationships. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 to 28, we read this. It's the words of Jesus. It says, Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
Serving others will improve our relationships. Your relationships will get better the more you learn how to serve. And that's something that we need to practice. We need to continue to do and grow in. And it will improve our relationships because of a simple, single reason. That at the root of every, I think, relational problem is a root of self-centeredness. There are other issues, for sure, but when we come down to it, self-centeredness is something that all of us deal with, and it impacts all of our relationships. I want what I want when I want it, and you want what you want when you want it. And we need to be able to come to a place where we can recognize that and also begin to go beyond that simple self-centeredness. Because it only really causes conflict. It doesn't mean that we never get what we want. But it does mean that it doesn't become the heart of everything that we go after in life. Because if we all do this well and do it right, not only are we serving others, but others are also serving us. It is a lifelong task to learn how to become unselfish or less selfish. Some people don't move very far on that journey. Some people go a long, long ways. Some people go their whole lives living only for themselves. But God wants you and he wants me to learn to become more like him. He loves us so extravagantly that he gave us his only son. Throughout scripture, we see his desire, his calling of his people back again and again and again. Because he wants us to be with him and like him. And the way that we do that is by copying him, learning to become like him, like Jesus did. And in this passage, it gives us a great example of how Jesus gave of his own life and how we too need to model ourselves in a similar fashion. When you take on the attitude of Jesus, you begin to live your life not for the benefit of yourself, but you begin to live your life for the benefit of others. And when we do that, it honors God. When we become a bivocational minister, taking him with us and serving or ministering in every situation that life places us in, it brings honor to him as we become more like him. When we continue to serve people unselfishly, they begin to take notice something different about that person. You know, why did they do that? I always found it interesting. Um, I worked for three different summers while I was in Bible school at um, the Potash Mine near Vanskoy, at Agri and Vanskoy. And so I spent four months each summer underground working with a production crew. My dad worked there, and he wasn't too excited, I think, when I asked if I could apply as a summer student because he knew what it was like to work underground, and he didn't really want me to be exposed to that, I think. Uh, It can be really rough, but they were amazing summers as I spent time on three different crews with three different guys, and I I went down the very first week. I I may have shared this many, many years ago, but I went down. We had a week of training, and it was the very first time I joined with my crew the first summer I was there, and we all, there was me, myself, and one other summer student on that crew. And you stick out when you're the new guy because your hard hat is still shiny and your boots aren't scuffed up and there's no stains in your overalls, right? And we're standing in the cage that is what they call the elevator. There's about 24 of us. And just like every elevator you ride in, everybody walks in and turns around and faces the door. And so I'm standing at the back wall and I've got my big lunchbox under my arm and we're riding down and someone turns to the other student and says so what are you taking in school and he says well i'm in commerce at the u of s and the guy goes oh that's that's a good job you won't have to work in a place like this then good for you 
And then they look at me and they say, what are, and what are you taking in school? And I said, well, I'm a Bible college student. All 24 heads turned around and they went like this. And they went back up. And then they turned around, not another word. So we reached the bottom. And I thought to myself, it's going to be a fun summer. <laughs> but what was fascinating to me was as I lived my life, the way that I think God has called me to live it, these men, many of them much older than I was and farther along in life, uh, recognized something different. Some of them tried to push buttons. Some of them realized that it didn't really work. I had worked other places in construction and building houses, and I had been around this kind of uh, work before. <clears throat> but they tried, and it didn't go very far. But every summer, without fail, there would be conversations I would have one-on-one -on -one with guys who just recognized that there was something different, and I became a safe place that they could come to for help. The first summer I was there, it was just a few weeks into the job, and I was sitting with an, one guy at a lunch table underground in the middle of the night, and uh, he just broke down, started crying. Uh, his marriage was failing. His wife told him that day that she was going to leave him, and he had two teenage kids, and he was looking for advice. I'll never forget the feeling of thinking, God, you got to help me here. But there was something different that he recognized, not because of something I told him. I didn't go around saying, if you ever have trouble in life, come talk to me. But because there was something different about the way I lived and the what things that I did. When we become bivocational ministers, people will begin to see different things in us because it's God in us, causing us to do those things in life. Why do they do this? Why are they so nice? Why did they return the cart to the cart corral? Simple things that make a difference. I realized that people do watch and they do pay attention, don't they? And you never know when that will come back. There's a verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 11, 17. It basically says, those who are kind benefit themselves, but the cruel bring ruin upon themselves. Another translation of that same verse says, you do yourself a favor when you are kind. It has nothing to do with karma. It has everything to do with showing people the goodness of God and how it can change us because it's to him who we give all the credit. The third aspect of serving others is we need to serve others unselfishly. Serving others unselfishly will make my life meaningful. This can be a big surprise, but it is also very, very true. When we serve others, it gives us meaning, because God wired us to serve others. Meaning in life doesn't come from work or money or stuff, but from purpose. And God wired us to care for and find meaning in helping other people. I didn't take the time to find a whole study, but there was a university in the States that was, it was a psychological study on people, and they hired a bunch of university students one summer to come and dig a ditch. And then they were told to fill the ditch back in. And then they came back the next day and they dug it up again. And then after lunch, they filled it back in again. And they were studying meaning in people's life. And every day they increased their wage. And every day people continued to quit. By the end, they were making four times what they could have made in any other job. And as a summer student, someone trying to save money for university, they thought that would be very appealing to make four times what they could anywhere else. But they couldn't handle not doing something that had any meaning to dig the same ditch and then fill it back in and get paid for it didn't matter how much they were getting paid. They needed to do something that provided meaning or purpose. 
is true with us as well. People want purpose. In Mark 8.35, Jesus said, Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Whoever loses it, whoever gives it away to others, right? That's what it means. Whoever gives it to God and lives for him will truly save their life. Living for someone else. Living because of someone else. Later on, you can look up the verse that I listed in your page, uh, 1 Corinthians 15.58. I think I wrote it on your handout. 1 Corinthians 15.58 basically says, Our work in the Lord is never wasted. Whether we see the fruit of it now or not, our work done for him is never wasted wasted everything we do for Jesus has a purpose even if it seems insignificant and maybe others think it's not important or we may think that no one will ever notice so why would we bother but everything that we do because of him and for him is significant famous passage in Matthew 25, Jesus said that even if you give a cup of cold water in my name, you will be rewarded in eternity for it. And that brings the fourth reason up. In serving others, I will leave a legacy. Actually, we'll leave two different legacies. One on earth, as people remember the things that we have done, especially for them. But even these things won't last long. Maybe three generations will remember our greatest accomplishments. Maybe. The trophies will all be recycled. Everything will change. But the second legacy, the legacy that is left in eternity, will last forever and ever. We all want our lives to matter and to have significance and to have meaning and purpose. And to do that, we need to look at the one who created us to understand what it is within us that we can do to leave a legacy that lasts forever. What can we do? How can we serve? How can we do something that will make a truly lasting impact? Whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant. It's the middle of a verse that we read just a little bit earlier. But the more we serve, the greater things will be. The more you serve, the more influence you will have. In reading through the Purpose Driven Life, you'll find a passage that, uh, a chapter that Rick Warren talks about, he calls it the Mother Teresa syndrome. <clears throat> Mother Teresa went to the poorest of the poor, the most, she, the most outcast of outcasts in Calcutta, India, to people who were dying in the street. Nobody had less influence than this group of people. And she began to take the dying into her home, and she cared for them. She began to serve them and love those who everybody else trampled over. And as she went to the least influential people in the world and gave of her life in order to serve them in God's name, God God gave her great and enormous influence around the world, didn't he? She could walk into any presidential office or Congress or the United Nations and people would stop and listen, and they did. Not because of something that she had accomplished that we would see as significant, but because of the ways that she gave her life in service to those who were the least. If you want to be great, you must learn to be a servant of all. There's a couple more verses that go along with that. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, it says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. God sees you. And he will not forget. 
In John 12, 26, 26, it says, Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Not only will he see you and not forget you, he will honor you. And if you want to leave a legacy that will last forever, then you need to serve God and the things that he is calling you to. And it will make an impact that doesn't only last for a generation or two or three, but lasts for eternity. The greatest way to use your life is to invest it in that which will outlast your life. And I think we have three choices in how we can spend our life. We can live our life. We can spend it, we can waste it, or we can invest it. I think the best use is to invest it in things that will outlast. So if you're building your life on the word of God, part of his people, and serving and giving of yourself, you are investing into things that will last way beyond this age and this generation. So as the worship team comes up for a closing song, I have just three things to encourage us to look at this week. It's kind of the what next. We need to invest. We need to find ways to use the talents that God has given us. And I want you to think of these three questions. What can I do individually? What are my talents? Many of you are serving already, and I am so grateful for that. But maybe there are ways that God has been nudging you to take a further step. Maybe you're not serving, and God is encouraging you to step in. What can I do? Next, what can I do with friends, with our small group? When we gather together with a body of people, of believers, and we commit to do something, great things happen. We have a group of ladies who quilt downstairs throughout the winter months, and they have given away literally hundreds and hundreds of quilts and all kinds of other things. You can look in the annual meeting minutes each year for the list of stuff. They come together, and they serve those in need, and great things happen. So what can you do with others? And what can you do with your family? How can you invest in the future? Because investing in the future really is investing in those younger than you. There's another insert in your bulletin with some pictures on the front, and on the back is a list of just a few of the things that some people invest in in the church. Maybe there's something there that you are interested in helping with, investing in. If there is something, I encourage you to use that communication card, write your name on it, put it on there, and drop it in the box, and we'll get a hold of you and we can talk about it. If you're not sure where you could maybe serve or how you would best fit, then put your name on the card, say that, and put it in the box, or give me a call or an email this week, and I'd love to take you out for coffee and just talk about what God's doing in your life. But today I challenge you to think about what's next, how you will serve, how you will minister, and what you will want to invest in this generation that will impact generations into the future. I think there's great, great things happening and so much more that God has in store for us as we commit ourselves to Him. We have one closing song that I encourage you to sing with us. <laughs>